Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Gregory Hogstead, who will introduce uh, Professor DeGem. Dr. Hogstead is a 1985 graduate of Gustavus Adolphus College, who then left us and went on to earn his PhD at the University of Minnesota, and is currently employed there as a research associate at the Center for Interfacial Engineering. Today's final speaker, Pierre-Gilles Dijen, is a theoretical physicist with an uncommon ability to extract underlying fundamental principles of nature from complex systems. His four decades of work seem to span the entire spectrum of condensed matter research. Magnetism, superconductivity, liquid crystals, synthetic and biological polymers, gels, surfactants, wetting, adhesion, viscoelasticity, fracture, an unparalleled display of versatility and creativity. His theories provide cornerstone understandings of several broad and largely disjoint fields, as witnessed by the status of classic achieved by three of his books. These works have had a vital impact on research in physics, chemistry, material science, and engineering, and technologies ranging from plastics to flat screen video displays. In the 1980s, Professor Dijen became interested in interfacial problems that is, the molecular structures, properties, and interactions localized at the boundaries between dissimilar materials. His writings provide unified and elegant descriptions of the spreading of liquids on surfaces and the behavior of polymer molecules attached to surfaces. He has succeeded in combining the rigorous and mathematical with the intuitive and visual to shed light on the physics of interacting chain-like molecules. These interactions lie at the heart of the science of soft matter, a term Professor Dijen applies to materials displaying both complexity and flexibility. Of extreme technological importance are the scientific principles governing adhesion at the molecular scale. This is the subject of Professor Dijen's talk today. Professor Dijen. First, thank you all for coming in this dark room rather than staying in these sunny gardens. I will try to talk only about simple things. And about glues, that is a very good starting point. From long ago, from the Stone Age, we have been able to operate glues. And I have listed a few spectacular examples here one which has had a strong historical impact is the Phoenician invention of materials who were both glues and sealants, and which then could allow to build ships which resisted all the torments of sea. And the success of the Phoenician navy apparently is largely due to this particular invention so that a simple, modest technique like this has had a large impact on history. Well, there are many examples of this sort. Uh, I won't go in all these examples. Let me go on with the more recent part of the list. In the 1900s, we begin to be able to bind shoes with suitable glues and wood. And something very important happens about this time. Two things converge. Science often proceeds by the convergence of very different abilities. In this case, on one side, we have the invention of artificial polymers, long chain molecules. These things begin to be created at the early times of this century. And the second converging factor is the onset of the aircraft industry. These early aircraft are built of wood, and very often it is needed to have them glue. The convergence of these factors creates an amazing chemical revolution. We were talking about the inventivity of chemists. They have been just amazing during the following years in creating new systems which we now uh, practice in 
every day of our life. And for instance, we can say that we can glue together things which in my youth would never accept to be glued, such as metal and glass or things of this sort. We also are in a situation where we can glue things and have them stay together even at very high temperatures. For instance, in the nose of a plane or a missile where we reach temperatures which are at the range of 400 centigrade, uh, we can operate, build up a thing with glue to resist these high temperatures, at least for the lifetime of a missile. Similarly, we can glue things very fast. The typical process is when you bind books or something like this. This is done by a very clever group of agents called the hot melt, and which are able to stamp and get cold very fast and get your book being bound in an extremely high speed. So this is a great art, but it is a difficult science, as most novel sciences. And being a teacher, I've had to try and teach courses on adhesion, on the principles of glue, and these courses are extremely painful at the start because they really look like cookbook recipes. And cookbook recipes are quite useful. Very fortunately, we can use it for, I don't know, New York steak in this country, or corn, things like this. But uh, the cookbook recipes are dangerous in technology because if a new problem shows up, it, it is not at all clear that you can solve it with the old recipe. And in this sense, you need deeper principles, which are just in birth. We are not yet very far in this. The difficulty is quite clear. This thing is mixing chemistry, and I said chemistry is so inventive in this, rheology, the way things deform and flow and so on. Fracture mechanics, because well, ultimately you separate two parts, you create a fracture. Surface physics, because you are operating on surfaces all the time. Maybe the most unifying feature is polymer science, the science of long, flexible molecules, if you wish, of noodles at a minute scale. Polymers are omnipresent in this thing. All glues are based on polymers, and we may come back to this in a few instances. There is another part which occurs in these young sciences, uh, which is that you often don't really know what you should measure. You see, if you think of defining the quality of a glue, the natural thing you do, and which is done by engineers for a hundred years or so, is you take two solid pieces and you paste them with some glue and certain area A and then you let the thing incubate. Ultimately, you pull with some large force F, and you look at what particular value of the force the thing ultimately separates. And you have a sneaking suspicion that it is not really the force that matters, but the ratio of force to area, what we call the stress. So you're tempted to say that this critical stress, sigma C, is the thing which defines the quality of an adhesive, but not so. And to show this to you, let me start by another type of experiment, which is again something most of us have done once or twice. Suppose you have a piece of scotch tape, and this is the scotch tape, and you've stuck it on a vertical wall. And now you start peeling it in a certain direction with a certain angle here, a certain velocity. This is written in French, I apologize, but I think it's a good exercise for you to guess what this means peeling. <coughs> well, what you measure in this way is the force per unit length along the third direction here. The force which is required to pull out your scotch tape. 
This has dimensions of force per unit length or energy per unit area. And it is the crucial parameter de describing how a glue uh, works. Let's call it G or separation energy. It is in fact more than a parameter because you can repeat this experiment at various speeds and you will get different numbers. You will have a whole plot of separation energy versus velocity and this plot tells you a lot of things. For instance, if you are interested in having adhesives for this thing on the ground here or adhesives for these things on the wall, you're not at all using the same parts of this G of V function. This thing is really works at zero velocity. This thing is related to what my heel does on the surface and operates at finite velocity. So this whole function here contains a wealth of information about the quality of glute. But the puzzle is the following. This animal, this separation energy, has nothing to do with the separation stress. In fact, they don't have even the same dimensions. This G is an energy per unit area, while a stress is a force per unit area. So we're talking about two completely different objects in science, and how do we relate them? Well, this was achieved in the 20s and 30s by great people in mechanics, in particular Griffiths and a few others. And it's an interesting point. Here I have shown these two solid pieces connected by a certain thickness of glue. I have called this thickness W, typically something like a fraction of a millimeter or less. And I'm pulling hard, and at some moment the glue breaks. I've shown this here, there is a fracture which is expanding towards the center. Now what is the condition for this thing to happen? The answer which Griffith provided is about this, that in this region here, which is not fractured yet, the poor glue is, is suffering very much. It is distorted by the stress and it has stored elastic energy. And the moment this thing decides to break in is the moment where I can transform from this deformed glue to relaxed glue in the fractured part in such a way that the elastic energy stored here per unit area just balances the G energy, the separation energy. Now this defines a certain relation between the stress and the G but look at this, the elastic energy which is stored here depends not only on the stress, it depends on what thickness I have. If I have a large thickness, I always will have a large energy stored. And then a very small stress will be enough to provide this balance. The conclusion from all this is that the stress sigma c, which we measure when we separate two pieces, is not an intrinsic property of the glue. It depends on how much thickness I have chosen to put. So sigma c is not a well-defined property of a glue. The sad thing is that all the engineering tests operate in the opposite order and measure sigma c. But uh, for all fundamental purposes, it is the energy which is the important thing. But so much for this definition of adhesion, which was provided to us by the people in mechanics. Now, let me go to what makes things stick. And as often in theory, and in fact, as you may have even noticed in the talks today, theorists operate in the following way. Uh, they have a problem, and they say, oh, I cannot solve this problem, but I can solve another one, which vaguely resembles the first. Well, this is exactly what I'm going to do for a start here. There is one case where adhesion is relatively simple to understand. It is when I have a very poor glue. Let me take a simple example. Here are my two hands, relatively clean, and let me put them together. There is some adhesion between them. There are what we call in chemistry van der Waals forces. There are little attractions between the molecules or proteins at the surface of my hand. 
But these forces are quite weak, and the net result is that, fortunately, I can separate my hand. And what is more is that when I do separate them, I find them approximately in the same state they were in before, which in our pompous language is called a reversible process or a thermodynamic process. Now the meaning of all this is that in this weak limit, we can describe adhesion if we know the energies involved on the surfaces, the energy of this bare hand against air and the energy of these two hands facing each other, the surface energy. Now, if we know these, we can predict everything about pulling out, pulling in, because we know the corresponding Gs. Let me show this to you first on a simple example. Suppose I have pasted this uh, glue in liquid form on my surface. And I want to paste it well. Now, to paste it well, the situation must be such that really the solid surface likes the glue. Or in a more physical term, if I compare the surface energy of the bare solid to the sum of solid to glue and glue to vacuum air, but well, if I make this comparison, I must gain in energy by spreading. And this is what is described by this coefficient here, which is called the spreading coefficient. If this coefficient is positive, the thing will like to spread. And this is what I want. In fact, this coefficient is an American invention. Cooper and Nuttall, during First World War, they were concerned with spreading insecticides on leaves. And they realized that their insecticides worked well if this parameter here was large. So you see very practical things lead to pretty universal concepts and all these things. Well, this is experiment one. If I want to have a glue which spreads nicely, I want this combination to be positive. And this is useful because very often I will have a poor brush of a surface, will be irregular, things of this sort. And I want this liquid spontaneously to go in all the little corners. And so, so I want this. Then, second experiment, I have prepared my glue and it has in some sense dried out or cured. Uh, so it has become somewhat solid. And now I break it. Suppose I have two pieces again and I separate. Now, this breaking may happen in two ways, which I have shown here. One way is in the bulk of the glue, what is called cohesive rupture. And clearly the energy to create this is just two times the surface energy of the glue. Or there is another possibility, which is that the glue really had no very strong affinity to the solid walls, so that then I will detach at the solid surface. And then the energy involved in creating this thing is the difference between this pair and this thing here, that's this combination here. Now you see, I have two possible ways of breaking my glue and they cost different energy. In most cases, what nature will choose is the path of least energy, just like we do. And the net conclusion is that I have to compare these two. If I take this difference, G adhesive minus G cohesive, and if this difference is positive, well, I'm happy. I'll tell you why. Because if it's positive, it means that this will occur and not that. And this means that I will not be dependent of having not really stuck my glue properly to the wall. I will have stuck well to the wall and I am limited only by the intrinsic strength of the glue. This poor glue has to yield at some moment. So I want this rather than that. It's an indication that I work properly. Now, if you look at the simple algebra which is involved in there, you end up with a remarkable relation, which is one of the few happy surprises of nature, I would call it, which is that indeed, if this Cooper natural parameter S was positive, which is what I want for spreading, well, at the same time, this energy difference will be positive, which means that I will have the cohesive rupture which I want. But why did I go into this exercise? It is to 
show you the sort of arguments which we need when we build up things starting from these energy ideas. We measure these energies by various tricks, and then we can predict the quality of this or that system, provided we are in the weak adhesion regime. This is not useless. The first example is these post-it papers, which are sold by 3M and made not very far from here. In fact. Another example I met after a talk like this. I was going out, and a young man comes to me, and he has a photograph in his hand, and he says, you know, I think you might help me. Uh, I make sculptures. And he showed me a beautiful sculpture of his girlfriend, a bronze, which uh, he had made, and he had the photograph. Uh, indeed, there was no problem with the girlfriend, but there was, he said, I have a problem. And that was the following. He was putting a mold directly on her body. And in some instances it worked and he could take the mold out and cast bronze inside. In some cases the mold didn't want to go out and then his relation was in great danger. So he wanted help. Uh, the answer is in fact provided by chemistry nowadays when you mold statues in the mold in this plaster you put a thin film of silicone oil and you ask this film different requirements. It's a more complex problem than this one. You ask it to uh, stick to the plaster and to, be, to, to quit the bronze easily once you have formed the bronze, but to stay on the plaster side because you want to use your silicone layering many times. So you see this is a more complex problem because you have the girlfriend, the silicone, and the plaster and the bronze, there are more partners. But you can discuss all these partners in terms of these concepts and come up with a safe operation for a couple like this. So it is sometimes useful. So to summarize this piece, I would say that we have these weakly adhesive systems which are controlled by the weak forces which is between my hands and which are reversible. And if you want to put a number into this, if you do science, you have to put numbers at some moment. The energy which is involved, the Gs, the energy per unit area, is very small. For our standards, it is something like five uh, centijoules per meter squared or so. Now, this is not at all what we have when we buy a glue at the supermarket super glue at the supermarket and we are talking about energies which are something like uh, 100,000 times bigger than that. So what makes the quality of real glues? Well, this is not entirely obvious and I've had interesting talks with my chemical friends about that. Chemists often think that it is very simple. If I want to glue this piece to this piece, I create some strong chemical bonds between the two. And there is clearly some truth into this because if I do not create chemical bonds, I come back to this hand problem. I just have Van der Waals forces. But the point is that chemical bonds are not at all sufficient. And this you can see just by numbers. I mean, if you think of establishing chemical bonds between two surfaces, and you count how many atoms you have per centimeter squared, and you say that each atom has a typical chemical binding energy to the, its neighbor on the other side. And you say, I slice all that, how, many, how much energy do I have to pay? Well, the answer is of the order of one joule per meter squared. So it is 20 or 50 times bigger than Van der Waals. But it is still stupidly small when compared to realistic glue. So we are still missing something very important. And my chemical friends, they don't always understand that. I was called talking not long ago with Jean-Marie Laine, who is my colleague in France and who is a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, so he should know some. And um, he had established a very clever system, and he's a brilliant guy. He had established a clever system where he could prepare two papers and one would carry a certain molecule and the other would carry a different molecule, but these two molecules would recognize each other and stick. 
while if you would use a third molecule on this side, no sticking at all. So that was a very intelligent idea, but I had to explain to him that if he created good bonds between the two, he wouldn't have something sticky. However, he would have this very stupid number and not more. I may come back to this point uh, later because it's a nice point. Well, what happens in practice if you break a glue or if you break a piece of plastic, for instance, a polymer substance, is that you are very far from reversible conditions. You are really hurting the material very much. One example which I could take, unfortunately, I didn't think of bringing this, but I could have brought a plastic bottle, a polystyrene bottle. This does exist still in the American market. And suppose I bend it very strongly. But at the low place where I bend it very strongly, I put it under strong torture, you notice it becomes whitish. This is something which you can really do with your kids at home. It becomes whitish. That means that some objects of size comparable to the wavelength of light, a micrometer or so, have been structured inside this plastic sheet. What are these objects? They are what we call crazes. Beautiful word and beautiful object. Here is one craze in a polystyrene matrix. All over there we have glassy polystyrene. Just as we know it, it's a solid and it's pretty firm. It's made of long molecules. If you wish, you could think of it as a plate of noodles which has been frozen, something like this. But I've been pulling on that firmly, and this thing has partly yielded. Some bubbles of air have grown in this region, in this very flat pancake region. And the admirable thing is that there remain some connecting pillars, if you wish, like in a Greek temple. But if I compare the sizes, I am in the 10 to the 9 range, or something like this. This is a very small Greek temple. Why, why do I have these pillars of matter? Well, the answer is close to something you notice if you put your finger in honey or maybe in maple syrup in this room, I don't know. Uh, you pull it out and you get a fiber. And any viscous polymer tends to do this. So that when I'm pulling here, I'm pulling so hard that locally this thing is becoming a liquid like honey because it's so tortured. And this liquid makes fibers. These fibers are very amazing. Their width is very small, maybe 10 times the size of a little molecule. Their height is much larger. They are real pillars. Their height is in the range of micrometers, and this is why this thing becomes whitish. And they still carry load. You see, this thing is not purely passive. It is still resisting my force here. And this is why plastics are good, incidentally. It is admirable that they can resist much better than glass. The reason why is this, because these fibers occur when you have noodle-like molecules in it. They don't occur if you have plain glass. Well, this is the basic way in which plastics of this family can make good glues. If I ultimately fracture, if I tell them I really want to separate you too. I succeed in building a fractured region here, but it is always announced by a long case region. And the energy which is dissipated in making these fibers from a glassy material is very large. So for this reason, we have very robust plastics and very good glassy glues. This is really one of the major sources of polymers as adhesives, the fact that they can make these very dissipative structures. It's not the only process, and I cannot resist talking to you about another example because it has uh, a, a, a connotation of everyday life. Uh, you have all watched car races, and you have seen these cars changing their tires very often, every second hour or so. And you may have noticed that when the pilot has changed his tires and he's leaving out 
and screeches and so on, he leaves a very dark track under each wheel. This rubber, which he has on his tires, is so soft that it leaves a visible track all along. It's very soft rubber, or what we call poorly cross-linked rubber. Why is this a good thing? Well, let me spend a minute talking to you first about what rubber is. Here is the basic experiment about rubber, which has been performed by American Indians for 4,000 years or more. They take the sap, the latex from the heavier tree, it's some sort of whitish liquid, very much like what you find in the dandelion here, and they, put, they paste it around their foot. And they let this thing, so-called, dry for 20 minutes or so. Lo and behold, after 20 minutes, instead of remaining as a liquid, it was a liquid, it was flowing like that, what they have is a boot. This amazed the early explorers, the 18th century explorers. They were very surprised by this, and it became a very powerful technology, something like uh, 1840 or so, when Mr. Goodyear changed the procedure slightly and produced what we call now natural rubber. What, what happens in this process? Well, the description is about what I have here. The original sap is something of this sort. It's like noodles floating in broth. You have independent noodles, and they, s they manage to worm their way around each other in some process, so it flows. It is a liquid. But then oxygen from the air comes around and reaches this structure, and oxygen has an admirable action. It binds noodles together. So that if you started from this, you end up with something which looks like a network, where the chains are connected. Now, locally, if I'm a very little fish, much smaller than this, and I'm swimming, I see no big difference between this and that. Both are liquids locally. But on larger scales, if I pull on this thing, this is not a liquid because it can resist deformations now. So this is a very special type of soft solid, and this is what we call a rubber. So this is what happens in the boot of this gentleman. Incidentally, uh, it's not a very good boot. Uh, it breaks after a day or so, because oxygen um, is n does not stop at doing this useful purpose. Oxygen also has an evil action and it decides to nibble the chains themselves. And it cuts them into pieces. And if you take a network or a fisherman's net, something of a sort, and you cut it at random, at some critical moment, it collapses. Well, this is what happens to the boot here, and this is why oxygen is not the best system. And Mr. Goodyear, by pure luck, apparently, had the idea of substituting sulfur for oxygen, boiling the sap with sulfur and obtained a beautiful rubber, which is our natural rubber. Why is that? It is because sulfur does bind the chains together, but sulfur being less reactive than oxygen is not strong enough to do the clipping, to do the evil action. And for that reason, sulfur is still used in our days to prepare rubber. So this is what rubber looks like. Now, I have to explain why very soft rubbers are very good for racing. Well, a very soft rubber, or as we call it, a weakly cross-linked rubber, is something where you have very few attachment points. So that many chains would be, say, stuck at one point and will be like a long dangling arm. Now this has very special effects, because if I now deform my rubber, and God knows that in these races this rubber gets very strongly deformed, if I deform it, these chains take a long time to adjust. There is a comparison, which is due to my colleague Michael Rubinstein, which I like. This long arm here, this long flexible arm, is reminiscent of an octopus being trapped in a fisherman's net. And this octopus tries to get his arms back and forth and so, and it's very painful. 
and very slow. So conclusion, these weakly cross-linked rubbers, these weak rubbers, have very long relaxation times. They respond slowly when they are told to do so. Why is this good? Well, I'll try to explain it in the next little drawing here. This represents a tire. You should think of the wheel of a car, something pretty large here. And we're just watching the bottom of a wheel and it is sticking to the road. For a moment, I'm talking about a dry road. And uh, it is sticking here. And this car is advancing at a velocity this is not a race car, really, which I had in mind here. It's 60 kilometers per hour. Now, you people don't know what a kilometer is. A kilometer is a unit which is still used in some savage countries beyond the ocean. Uh, uh, and this means 40 miles per hour, something of this sort. Uh, well, what happens when this thing is moving forward? This part is stuck. It doesn't move for a moment. But what happens is that this piece is separating. Air is entering on this side. And this front of the fracture, if you wish, is moving at 40 miles per hour in this way. So in this region, all horrible things happen. The rubber, which was sticking directly to the road, is torn out and suffers and moans, sometimes audibly. But uh, this is not the whole story. Apart from that, something else happens. Because you remember, this rubber is a very slow operator. It takes it a long time to understand that it has been suffering. So when this thing moves, this piece of rubber, one particular piece of rubber goes here and is torn, but it begins to relax only much later when it is in this region. In fact, at the distance V tau, where V is our car velocity and tau is the relaxation time of this rubber. Typically, this tour will be a millisecond. This velocity is 40 miles per hour, and so this distance is a centimeter or so. So what I'm telling you is that in this system, not only do we have horrible sufferings here, which give a big adhesion energy, that is always present, but we have other sufferings widespread in this region, and they will also contribute to the adhesion. And this is why these race cars stick so well to the ground. Now, those of you who are familiar with that sort of thing will say, ha ha, this, this looks fishy, because indeed there is something occurring here, but the stresses in this region are pretty weak. The stresses were much stronger over there. True, the stresses are pretty weak in my red region here, but on the other hand, the size of my red region is huge. It's something like an orange peel all around here. It's very big. And this overcompensates. The net conclusion is that these far field losses, as they are called, in this region here, can be a hundred times what you have in the near field region. So you stick a hundred times better. And this is how race car operates. Now, as always in life, there is a compromise in this because what I'm telling you is that if I make a very poorly cross-linked rubber, a very poor network, it sticks well, but of course it is very fragile. And this is why these pilots have to change their tires every second hour. So you see, I hope, on examples like this that we begin to have unifying concepts. We begin to have a few pilot ideas which allow us to teach to the students things beyond cookbook recipes. Now, this is, of course, a very partial story, and I cannot resist extending it a little bit, because I've been talking about interfaces, and I'm tempted to show you another of these interfacial problems, because here I can probably produce a, an experiment. Being in the United States, I have, of course, chosen a very complicated setup. It is based on this glass of water. Uh, here I have a sheet of polyethylene. Polyethylene hates water. It's the opposite of a Cooper nettle liquid, which liked the leaf. 
here, if I put a droplet, you see it doesn't spread at all. Polyethylene hates it. If I put more, well, I can get a somewhat larger area just because of reasons of weight. Because the weight of this thing squashes it out down to a millimeter or so. But still, the polyethylene defends itself and doesn't like to be wet. Now suppose I'm more brutal with it, and I do the following. I spread. Now you notice that the polyethylene defends itself, and that dry regions grow. Uh, ideally, they would grow like circles, but they grow with random shapes because I am so messy here. But if you have a sharp eye, I think you will notice that the growth of these dry regions essentially proceeds at constant speed, up to the moment where the thing stops because there is no water left or something like this. Well, this is what we call de-wetting, and I have idealized it here by this little drawing. And it is a subject which we have tried to study something like six, seven years ago. Looks simple, but of course, this is very messy. If you want to do it cleanly, you have to produce a very ideal surface, much better than this current surface. Actually, what I say to my students is this is very similar to the problem you have at home. If your floor has got messy, what does the family do? You buy a carpet. Well, same thing here. If uh, your surface is not very good, what you do is you bind little molecules on the surface and you make a very dense carpet of these molecules. In the language of chemistry, this is typically done by what is called silanation reaction, involving a silicon atom and a chlorine, and you couple that to an OH group on the surface. And it looks nice and simple, but it's extremely delicate and sensitive to impurities, to water, and so on. And I like to quote this story because I think it defines a certain spirit, and it's a spirit we should defend with our students. We asked a young man by the name of Jean Bruno to do this selenation operation. And many French students, if they had been asked at that moment to do this, would have said, oh, this requires very pure conditions. You must buy for me what is called a clean room, or some word like this in English, a special room with no dust where you enter with a mask and so on, and a special costume. It cost of a clean room at least $50,000 or so. But fortunately for us, Jean Bruno was not of this type. Jean Bruno um, had worked in very difficult conditions with no family. In fact, he was starting his PhD but gaining his uh, grub by working at the meteorology station. And during the night, he would establish these maps, which we watch on the paper the next morning. And then he would come to the lab at 10 or 11 in pretty poor condition, but a strong person, very energetic person. And Jean Bruno did not ask for a clean room. He fought for about a month, and then he came back to his director, and he said, you know, I will do this experiment, and I think I can succeed, but I will not do it in your messy lab. Maybe he didn't use these terms, but something equivalent. Uh, he said, I will do this experiment one sunny morning in the park in winter which meant really in the low conditions of lowest humidity. And he did that, and just that. And with this he got for what was at the time the best carpets available on the international market. I think this example is worth quoting because in our days we often speak to our students of the very heavy systems of research that we have, the big machines the synchrotrons, the neutron reactors, which we use all the time, which are sometimes useful, no problem. But they tend to think only of these and to forget this spirit of finding simple answers to a question before going to a big machine. I think that's very important, both from a point of view of the taxpayer, uh, 
who really does not always need the big machines he pays for. And also from the point of view of industry, because in industry, in most cases, when you have a sudden question about a surface problem like this, uh, say you're making photographic film and something goes wrong in the process and you don't have too much time, you will not have the time to bring your equipment and your complicated setup to a nuclear reactor or something like this. You have to invent simple means to probe things on the spot. So this is a little parenthesis about education. But uh, in any case, these people were able to find out the laws for this and to understand the relative processes which matter in this. Uh, and incidentally, we have been talking a lot about theory in physics today and material. I think this might convey to you a slightly distorted view. It is clear that theory is sometimes helpful, uh, sometimes completely wrong, and Phil gave us examples of that. Uh, theory can even have a very negative impact on research at some moment. But for this sort of problem here, I think the ratio is interesting. You see, these laws of de-wetting, which I've sketched here, they were established by a team of maybe four experimentalists working for three years, and six months, two theorists. That's the ratio. We need theory, but we need a well-balanced ratio. And very often we suffer, especially in our Latin countries where the education is all based on theory. We suffer from an excess of theory. Well, let me go on, since I was in this interface business, and also I mentioned cars, let me show you that this piece of work on de-wetting, how this surface resisted being covered by water, has found unexpected applications for us. One is this experiment here. Where I have, this is a British experiment because it rains heavily. Where, uh, and you can immediately notice the car is British. So um, you have uh, a, a film of water on the ground. And you are again driving at, say, 40 miles per hour or so. And you have a real problem there because a typical piece of rubber in your tire stays in contact in this immobile position, stays in contact with uh, this region here only for five milliseconds at this speed. It's not very much. And during this time, you desperately want that the water film, which I marked in red here, goes out. Because if it does not, you've lost your grip on the ground and you go in the next ditch. So we are facing a problem which is very related to what I was doing in my little experiment. Again, we have water which is against rubber and rubber doesn't like water and against asphalt and asphalt doesn't like water. So this is favorable. Dry patches tend to grow. But on the other hand, we have a more serious problem than what I had, because in my experiment, the top surface was air, and air is very deformable. Well, in this experiment, the top surface is rubber, and rubber doesn't like to be deformed that much. So for this reason, the laws of growth of this thing, which I sketched here, are very different and more sluggish than the laws of growth for the experiment I had before. Now, this in some sense has helped to understand this process which I think in English you call hydroplaning. In French we call it aquaplaning. Uh, will it have an impact on the car industry? I think not. The reason is that the people who make tires have tried everything and they have come up with the best answers which are compatible with other constraints. I mean, for instance, you could think of drawing some very fine little mm, ditches on your tire and you would improve the evacuation of this water, but these little pieces would be destroyed by driving one or two days. So from the point of view of the car industry, I don't think that these studies will bring a lot. 
On the other hand, they may bring a lot for the road industry. Because roads are made from a collection of little stone particles covered with asphalt. And in an intelligent choice of the distribution of sizes of these stones, you can react on this process in a useful way. So the hope is that these very fundamental ideas about DUI think will find out, will find some industrial channel in this case. Well, this was the first example which came out of this little experiment. The second example is very different. It is related to these stupid magazines which we read every week, the splendid four-color magazines. They are very stupid, but they really technically are very beautiful. When you look at the quality of the images and when you look at the speed, I mean, these magazines are typically produced by what is called the four-color offset system. They are produced at 35,000 copies per hour, printing four colors. But there are worries. And uh, sometimes, for instance, in a blue sky, you want a blue sky, and what you see is a cluster of white spots. And in Fr uh, the French printers call that moutonnage. A mouton is a sheep. It's like having an assembly of sheep in your blue sky. And it's no good. Uh, and there was, two years ago, there was a real question about this moutonnage. Uh, how does it operate? Well, the answer is that it is, again, a little cousin of my experiment here. Because when you have uh, printed, say, the green color, uh, you wanted to print some other parts in blue, so you have protected the future blue parts by water, by a water film. And then you bring the thing after it has been printed in green and other spots in front of this roll, which will put in the blue ink. And all this is proceeding as the, at these very high speeds, 35,000 copies per hour. So again, you must dispose of a water film in a very short time. And this resembles the preceding experiments. It resembles, but it's not identical. Because here we have a relatively hard partner, which is this roller. And on the other side, we have the paper, our magazine's paper. And this paper sucks in the water. So it's a different family of dynamics. But if you play with the same concepts and the same family of experiments, you can come up with some, I would say, some rules of the firm about how you can fight this moutonnage. And apparently this makes the printers very happy. Well, this was, ex exper let's say, industrial contact number two in this little sector. Let me end up with this last one, which I like very much, which is from the just a year ago, the fall, uh, a time where you work in vineyards. One typical problem with grapes, do you grow grapes here? I'm not sure in Minnesota, but you have heard about grapes. Uh, I mean, I've seen grapes being grown in New York State with very little success as regards to the wine, but uh, they, they do grow grapes. Uh, but a typical problem is to protect these grapes from various fungi. And the way you do this is you send some sort of mist, which I have tried to represent here by these little red droplets. And this mist will surround the grain, and hopefully it will do this. It will, trans it will create a uniform film of something which is mainly water, you cannot use any other liquid than water for health reasons in our days. So this is mainly water plus a little fungicide inside, and it, hopefully it will surround the grain. And then if it dries out, you will have an interesting protection. But unfortunately, a grain is covered by what people in agriculture call waxes. And waxes are very much like my polyethylene sheet. These waxes hate water. So the net result is that the surface of a grain does exactly the same thing which I was showing to you with my little experiment. It grows dry patches like this. And these dry patches push out the water and ultimately the water collects 
in the form of a little droplet at the bottom of a grain. And this is disastrous. Because typically, this grain is a centimeter. Maybe in California, it's two centimeters. But, uh, this thing is a millimeter in size. So in linear dimensions, you lose a factor of 10. In areas, in treated areas, you lose a factor of 100. So what can you do? Well, this is a problem which, where we had a good cooperation with an industry, which is Ron Poulenc. Uh, Ron Poulenc having a lot of interest in agricultural products. Um, starting with the same concepts and the same family of experiments, the Ron Poulenc people were able, just a little more than a year ago, to produce an additive which, when put into this thing, will prevent the formation of dry patches. Although in equilibrium they would like to be there, but this thing blocks the motion. And the net result is that maybe we don't gain the factor 100, which I estimated here, but apparently we need something that like 10 times less fungicide than we needed before because of this little thing. So you see this type of research can really help in our everyday life. And this brings me back to something which Phil said this morning. Uh, the science of everyday life is very important. It is important for many reasons. It's important because it's urgent for us in many cases. But it's also important because it has been underestimated because all the preceding generation was so excited with the great discoveries and big things like galaxies, small things like particles, that everyday life at that time was not considered. In fact, all what I have talked to you about, if it had been presented, say, five years ago, would have been considered as a very messy, strange subject, not worth of being talked at in a colloquium. But now things are different, and the science of everyday life is coming slowly up. And hopefully it will help each of us. It's important from that standpoint. It's important also from a taxpayer's standpoint. It's also important for us teachers because of our students. Uh, I find that in many sectors of science, the directors of PhDs and so on have a very reckless attitude where they put students on subjects which are of interest to themselves, but not necessarily of great national interest. I think this is not acceptable anymore. It was in the very expanding society of the 60s or so, but it is not anymore, and we have to be very careful on that. And this is the reason why this sort of simple experiment has a reason well, I'll stop at this point and thank you very much for your patient attention.
believe the ushers are circulating now with uh, cards for questions. Uh, let me remind you that this evening there will be two Nobel firing lines, uh, one of which will be uh, will uh, involve the three speakers from today, and the other will involve the four speakers tomorrow. Uh, if you wish to hold your questions, some of your questions uh, on the today's talks uh, until this evening, you're welcome to do that. Uh, those firing lines start at uh, 8.30, and they'll be held in the canteen and in Alumni Hall. I believe the one in the canteen will be the uh, speakers from today, and the one in Alumni Hall will be the speakers for tomorrow. Uh, also, since some of you will be leaving, uh, I can tell already, uh, I, I want to point out that this evening we have uh, a concert in the chapel at 7 o'clock, Nobel concert, that we have uh, a wonderful uh, display in the Schaefer Art Gallery, and you're all invited to see that, of course. Uh, and then, once again, the firing lines will be this evening. Uh, do we have a, an opening question? I, I well, you've gotten my interest, as you might have su suspected. Uh, you mentioned my friend Jean Moulin and uh, his recognition molecules, uh, which many of them actually involve a kind of bonding that you didn't talk about. You talked about putting your hand together, and that comes apart because the most you can have there is probably a weak van der Waals interaction. You talked about the really good glues which have cross-linking and a lot of covalent interaction, but you didn't talk about hydrogen bond interactions. And uh, if your hands, uh, in fact, uh, were orchestrated in such a way that uh, you could form many hydrogen bonds, it might be interesting. They might be very sticky. Uh, several questions. One, are there glues based on many, many hydrogen bond interactions? What's the mechanism of breakdown of a glue at high temperature? Is it, is it just cleavage of bonds, or is it, the once again, the evil action of oxygen? <laughs> or is it both? And finally, uh, if the bonds don't add up over a certain surface area to give you the adhesive energy, talking about what is the answer Very, uh, okay let's take three questions in order hydrogen bonds in action you quoted uh, this example of nucleotides now we have an example uh, in everyday life I would say which is when we face a siloxane chain silicone oil against things like silica usually you'd think these two things don't care about each other. But in fact, if you let incubate silica in front of silicone oils for something like hours or so at room temperature, you end up with a sticky surface. And apparently some bonding has taken place or some poison has been eliminated. We're not quite clear, but the, the possibility of hydrogen bonding between OH groups of the silica and the siloxane Itself. The oxygen from the siloxane is a good one. So hydrogen, hydrogen bonds we do meet. Now, let's say question number two was... Uh, the breakdown at high temperature. Wait. What's the mechanism of breakdown? Uh, so we have cases where oxygen is the promoter of our glue because very often you have a glue which is in a flask of salt and it's protected from oxygen and oxygen will act to induce reactions a little bit like in the Indian experiment, but in a more sophisticated way. Uh, I should say, inversely, that there has been beautiful inventions going the other way, the so-called anaerobic glues, which operate in such a way that they do not stick in the presence of oxygen, but if you put them in between two metals like copper, then the atmosphere which the copper creates, which is a reducing atmosphere, will induce a reaction. So this thing will stick only when it is exposed to the right metal. And this, I think, is beautiful chemical invention. So there are, but 
If you ask me about mechanism, I find that even in this anaerobic process, which is a beautiful invention, ultimately we know a lot about chemical kinetics in it, but we don't have a complete vision of how it works. So my general feeling is that most of the degradation studies still need a lot more. Ah oui, so where, where does the adhesive energy come from? Oui, oui. But, uh, in this uh, crazy case, it was pulling out fibers. In the uh, race car example, it was uh, this slow relaxation very far from the object. In Jean-Marie's case, the answer is that if you just put the two molecules stuck on two surfaces, you won't get much. But if you put them on two spaces, um, you chemists are very good at providing intelligent spaces. Then the spaces will store elastic energy. And when you separate, you will have much more energy to sacrifice. So the trick to make Jean-Marie's object really useful is to put it on long spaces. I'd like to ask uh, Professor Dejan and also the panel to reflect a little bit on mathematics. Um, we philosophers uh, sometimes look over at the scientists a case of equation energy, um, something that we uh, really are tend to be uh, bereft of by and large, although some of the uh, logical folks try to develop symbolism of rather extensive character, but still, it's not quite the same as mathematics and science. And I'm curious, um, that, that wonderfully lucid talk that uh, Professor Dijen just gave, in the middle of it, he said, to do science, you must put in numbers at some point. And of course, we all recognize that uh, that is true. At the same time, um, the talk that you gave was so lucid because, in fact, there was uh, not very much in the way of mathematics there. You appealed to our sense of the intuition of the relationship among uh, variables that we could understand uh, through your images and so on, and uh, related to practical life. And it set me thinking. Um, as to what the real importance of mathematics and some of its dangers might be. That is, uh, math obviously helps us in many ways. It helps us in terms of precision. It, its precision helps us in terms of prediction. There are certain definite human purposes that mathematics assists. But on the other hand, it's highly abstract. And uh, it is, in fact, so abstract that unless we already have some prior concept of why it's important, um, we would have no good reason to be interested, uh, at least in a, in a scientific way. We might be interested in a mathematical, pure way. But from a scientific point of view, we don't know why we should be interested in a set of mathematics unless there is already something there to guide our interest. And furthermore, mathematics could even be um, so precise and so compelling that it might make us think prematurely that we have entered the domain of the boring. That is, that something is settled, when, because it is settled in mathematics when, in fact, it is not settled. Although it's settled as a sociological fact, it somehow comes unglued again, if I may make a bad pun on your point. But um, so what I'm curious about is why mathematics? I mean, of course, yes, we need it, but do we need to keep it in some kind of balance? As you said yourself, similar to the way in which theory is related to uh, the, the practical aspect. Uh, I'd like maybe several people to give me a sense uh, of what... I'm sure we'll have many reactions yeah, what, to that. What, why is that? Uh, 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 first observation is that this sort of discussion is very different in our Latin country than here. Here, the young students are usually underdeveloped in mathematics and uh, we dream of having them learning a little more. In the French system, it is different. They are selected by mathematics by and large. And this I find a very dangerous thing. I'm very fond of mathematics. I think all of us here are fond of mathematics as a science. But I'm not fond of it as a selecting agent. Because then it is all based on one particular ability, uh, which is beautiful ability, but it is not the only one in life. And qualities such as the sense of observation, and the sense of uh, a certain handicraft, that sort of thing, doing something well, which the Japanese have so much. Well, these senses are completely underestimated in our French selection system because it's entirely based on mathematics. So far, but 
from that point of view, in France, I am very critical to the role of mathematics as an education, although I love that as a science. The question is an interesting one. Uh, given uh, the people sitting at this table, being a historian, what I always found interesting is that somehow we, we tend to make physics and, math and its mathematical apparatuses, uh, so to say, the supreme model for how to do science. Explored area, which probably would be much more rewarding for the next decade or so, is trying to understand how chemists think, because their language, uh, the kinds of symbols which they use, are simply not mathematical. And trying to understand precisely how they develop an intuition into their world by using this kind of imagery and this way of representing the object that we deal with this is something which we haven't explored and we could pay back understanding. Well, I agree with uh, Professor Dejean. That I'm from Caltech where the only criterion we have for acceptance is mathematics. I mean, we look at mathematics scores and if they're high, we take people and if they're low, we don't. We don't have a way of, a, of really looking at what you're getting at these other uh, powers of observation, uh, staying power, et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, without <coughs> mathematics, uh, chemistry would be absolutely nowhere nowadays. All of the modern advances in chemistry have come with, uh, uh, based on mathematics and an ability to actually do mathematics in, in one way or another. And that's what's lifted chemistry out of a sort of dark age in, into a real revolution. That and a lot of instrumentation, a lot of high-powered instrumentation, the uh, ability to work with it. So I think the chemists uh, would be horrified, uh, actually, to think about uh, now working on into the future uh, without building in uh, very deep uh, mathematical roots and so forth. Although we are a little crazy in giving talks, uh, uh, we tend to give them without mathematics uh, to try to communicate. There is such a thing as a language of chemistry. It's based on the periodic table. Uh, you can, and chemists go around on blackboards uh, drawing little lines and so forth and communicating without mathematics. Um, and it's kind of weird to watch them uh, uh, go around. They have this language, and if, if you're into it, uh, then uh, you're okay, and if you're not, uh, then you may as well, you know, do physics. Uh, uh, but you can you can discuss chemistry and large parts of chemistry without mathematics if you learn this foreign language. It's called the language which is based on the periodic table. Uh, but uh, these are just rambling observations. Uh, I, if I might, I, I think it's more than just foreign language, it's uh, very heavily metaphorical. We use models when we teach students about chemistry that are drawn from daily existence, and these things just don't translate well to small objects. And so I think we, we use mathematics to keep those models under control uh, to, to, for a reality check on those models. I think there is in a little, but a rather limited uh, validity to your to your uh, questioning of the use of mathematics, but I'm not sure that it's to be answered by the use of, of less sophisticated mathematics, but to the, by the use of more general concepts. I mean, mathematics is, in fact, crystallized logic, but more general concepts of logic, concepts using in inequalities rather than equalities, uh, that geometrical intuition you know, there is no, no really perfect way to express a fractal in mathematical terms, yet you can, you, you can describe the concept perfectly well.
And would you say chemists have actually figured out how to do this kind that of mathematics? For their, for their kind of thing. And if we could figure out uh, exactly how they've done this, it that would be That would be a, a new, diff different kind of mathematics. It's a kind of combinatorics, perhaps. I find in physics that people are much, that physicists, because they're mathematically, uh, their background is mathematics, are much more enamored of an answer that gives them perfect or a beautiful mathematical curve than they are of an answer that tells them, well, this is right and that's not right because there is this qualitative inequality, this qualitative difference between two behaviors, one with a, one temperature dependence and another with a different one, which is not expressed really in mathematical terms. And someone else will come along with a computer curve and he says, I can make something look vaguely like that with my computer. And the average physicist will believe the second man, and, uh, who is, in fact, not using as good mathematics usually. Well, you all demonstrate today. I mean, Professor Dijon says, well, I can't solve the real problem, but let me show you the one I can solve. And it's pretty close to this one, so let's talk about it. And uh, uh, that's not bad. Professor Dijon, a, a question from the audience. Is it possible to make a solid with a surface that no adhesive could stick to? If so, how? If not, why not? Hey, this is a very important practical question, and I'm very proud to say that we French have a company who has provided the closest answer to this. This is the so-called uh, Tefal frying pan. What is it made of? It is made of a Teflon surface uh, covering a steel frying pan. And it is, Teflon is really one of the materials which has the weaker van der Waals forces, so it sticks less, and you can cook in, on this Teflon, and uh, it will not stick. This has been a beautiful story. Uh, it, it, it started by two anglers who loved to fish trout and who were interested in frying pans, and they decided to establish a small company in a location near Annecy, where there is a lot of trout. And they started this company, and it went very well for a few years. At some moment, they started be selling frying pans in this country. And then the DuPont company got mad because they were using Teflon, and Teflon is a DuPont invention. So they tried to destroy them, just like Kodak. They tried to destroy Polaroid or things like this. And the fight was really David against Goliath. I mean, uh, Goliath has something like 100 lawyers on the case. David had one lawyer, but a dedicated group, a small group of scientists. And ultimately, David won. So I'm, I'm very fond of that story. <laughs> Another question from the audience. Uh, does adhesion have any role in the function of detergents? We, you might say that many detergents fight against adhesion, but they will make it sure that a dirt particle uh, will not stick to a textile fiber, for instance. So you might say that certain detergents are really lowering a certain G function. It's not their only role. I mean, they are active also as solubilizers. They are active also and when you uh, dry things, for instance, after washing all this little experiment. I didn't mention that side, but this little experiment on de-wetting is also very important when you wash your glasses and so on, because if you do not have this process which takes things away, when you dry, you would recover the little dust particles that you have striped to get out of the surface. It would just fall back again. And then the trick is to operate this way. So you see, detergents are important at least two or three stages in this washing operation with different functions. But one of them is very much what, what was said in the question. There's a question that I, uh, I, I think I can translate a little bit. It concerns the, uh, the capabilities of metal matrix composites uh, for bonding and their potential use in high strength, low weight applications, for example, airframes. Metal matrix. Metal matrix, really. But I would say probably the, the challenge of our day is uh, to construct this aircraft which will fly from San Francisco to Hong Kong with non stop 
and uh, this aircraft cannot be made of metal, it has be to be made of a composite, which might be carbon fiber against a very strong glue. And DuPont uh, has patented some remarkable glues to provide the matrix in this case. Now, the interesting question is that it is not yet sure whether Boeing in this country will make this aircraft or not, and I'm very worried. Admittedly, it's a, it's a terribly difficult construction, and you have to think of what it looks like. Typically, you have, say, I don't know the English words, but you have this piece which stands high up in the air behind the plane. It's about the size of this uh, ceiling here. And you are wrapping up something like huge bandages around the model of this thing and cooking then this up to 400 degrees centigrade. And you should operate it in such conditions that it never distorts in any way that it's ideal. So this construction is very hard. And at the moment, the people I'm told from Boeing and related companies are afraid on, of embarking in this program for the big parts, for the wings and so on. They use it already for small parts. but. For the big parts, they are afraid. And if they are afraid and if they don't do it, it is very clear in my mind that the Japanese industry, who is already a contractor of Boeing, who is learning the Boeing tricks very fast, within five, ten years, the Japanese industry will do it. And because they are so good at this handicraft part, they will have the technical staff to do this bandaging thing well. <laughs> I wonder if you'd be willing to share with us a couple of the areas that you believe um, in adhesion uh, hold the remaining important questions to be answered? Well, uh, it's a sad statement, but there are many things which we don't understand at all. For instance, I mentioned these polymers which craze, and for the crazing process, thanks in particular to Hugh Brown in California, I think we understand the G function pretty well. But if you take some of the glues you have in supermarkets, precisely these so-called super glues and some based on epoxy uh, polymerization, well, these things don't create. They, they, they are strongly cross-linked, so they cannot create, they cannot pull out in fibers. And the exact process by which an epoxy glue dissipates energy, I don't understand at all. So I think that is the big challenge of the time, because it is the typical question which your child will ask, how does this super glue work? Although super glues are uh, extremely glassy and wait, yeah, okay. Uh, that is uh, that's a collection of questions I have. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our participants and uh, all of you in the audience for staying on with us. Uh, once again, uh, let me invite you to the uh, the firing lines tonight at 8:30 in Alumni Hall and in the canteen area, and uh, have a, an enjoyable rest of the day. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah.